To this day, Japan continuously debates its place in World War II and the extent of their atrocities. It has taken many forms in the 77 years since Japan's surrender. It had been apologetic. It had even flat out denied the role of Japan as the aggressor in their expanding empire until its cataclysmic downfall in 1945. The historiography of Japan in World War II is in many ways no different than any other nation's view on the war. It changes with the social and economic zeitgeist of the period. But with Japan, it has taken a new form, almost opposite of the rest of the world. While the new left movement has since branched out into new and more popular forms, such as the race and gender movement or the ever popular postmodernist approach for good and for bad, Japan has shifted the other way, embracing not a new left, but a new right. This is not a definitive historiography of Japan's outlook on World War II. I've provided several links in the description to help flesh out these ideas further. Instead, this is an overview of the changing attitudes Japan holds over its imperial past, and in particular, its views on Japan's role during World War II. Japan was at total war. Its civilians were transformed into fictitious soldiers, while the country transformed into a fictitious battlefield. No longer were Japanese civilians separated from the military. Civilians trained with bamboo sticks and prepared for the inevitable allied invasion. They were to fight to the death for their emperor. Okinawa saw such fanaticism on full display, with civilians, Okinawan conscripts, and Imperial Japanese troops fighting to the death against the Americans. Thus, the final years of the Pacific War saw some of the most ferocious fighting of the conflict and made Allied leaders weary. Several cascading events helped force Japan to surrender in September of 1945. Three of the most prominent were the tight blockade, cutting off all supplies from Japan, two atomic bombs, and the Soviet Union's sweeping invasion of Manchuria. Two defining Japanese issues ended under the immediate American occupation. These are race and ideology. Yukiko Koshiro explains that Japan had a potent inferiority complex stemming from European and American imperialist tendencies. Japan must preserve its own race and prove itself the strongest in Asia. Specifically, Japan found itself pitted against the United States in the 1920s. Under American occupation, Japan's racial constructs crumbled. Shelving their racial ideology had the unintended side effects of downplaying Japan as the Asianic imperial power. America's occupation also de-deified the emperor, quickly throwing Japan's central ideology into disarray. Since birth, Japan's civilians learned that their emperor was a god, and that it was necessary to protect and die for the emperor when needed. Soldiers practiced a mock Bushido, and dying for their emperor is the highest of virtues. The kamikaze was the most prominent example of Japan's fanaticism towards such a notion. In September 1945, that leading ideology no longer officially existed. Japan now found itself in new territory. Political parties before outlawed were now able to partake in its democratization. All these parties would begin to ask themselves, what should Japan's relationship to the world be? How can Japan reconcile its atrocities but also respect its dead? These questions plague Japanese historians to this day. World War II's meaning is still elusive to the Japanese and they suffer from a drastic lack of consensus on their past imperial ambitions, and especially World War II. Japan's occupation dictated the first steps of its World War II historiography. Japan's cultural heritage was taboo. Japanese losses numbered approximately 3.4 million combatants and civilians, and another 4.5 million were wounded, and over 9 million people were left homeless. The period of memory is built on strong anti-war sentiments, but focuses from within, not from the outside. The notion is highly Japanese, where the debate and conflict remain inwards and confined within their own borders. Such internal searching is present in Japanese politics, media, pop culture, and its own history. Japanese historians face a deep gap within their history. Many of Japan's essential documents are gone due to either the fire bombings or the government deliberately destroyed them when Japan's surrender was announced. Thus, Japan's sources are mainly from American interrogations full of self-preservation, contradictory statements, and even coercion. Japanese historians had little to work with and relied heavily on American histories and records to fill in those gaps. However, that meant Japan had little for its own history, which helped blossom division as the U.S. occupation ended 
and memory grew further away. The 1950s birthed the notion the Shushin, or moral education. The Shushin is a critical agenda of the political conservatives. The United States wanted Japan as a westernized nation and a buffer against the Soviets and the Chinese. Nevertheless, Marxist historians prevailed the most during this time period. Ironically, they aligned with many notions the Americans wanted to promote. One aspect is the denunciation of Japanese fascism and militarism, and the exposure of how terrible the war was on Japan and its people. Their ability to thrive mainly had to do with the leftist movement countering Japanese fascism throughout the war, and the Marxist historians benefited because of it. At this stage, most Japanese histories were accounts that advocated the advanced pacifism and denounced the cruelty of the war, including textbooks, comic books, and films. Japan wanted the world to see them as a reformed and peaceful nation, bent on renouncing its militaristic tendencies. Japan's popular culture echoed these sentiments. Most films depicting the war focused on the individual, and they cursed Japan's imperialistic nature and aggression. Mizaki Kobayashi's three-part epic, The Human Condition, was one of the first Japanese films to ever depict Japan's atrocities against the Chinese people, as well as comfort women. Barefoot Gen, profoundly affected Japan's popular memory on the other end of the spectrum. The manga is about Hiroshima and its aftermath from the point of view of a child. The author of Barefoot Gen is an example of Japan's pent-up frustrations in the war's immediate aftermath, and Japan's suffering from the atomic bomb. On the one hand, works like The Human Condition criticize Japanese aggressiveness, on the other, Barefoot Gen helped sow the seeds of Japanese victimization. Both promoted pacifism. Japanese historians saw their country as the villain in World War II's narrative. Even if more conservative historians played their villainy down, the Marxist historians did not. This collective Japanese memory of its aggression provided ammunition for a reactionary wing to slowly manifest itself in the form of nationalism. Historians mention the oppression of Japan being the former invader and colonial power. The population began to yearn for the opposite. Japanese politicians began implementing revisionism, which took decades to truly manifest. Japan was in a state of total war, ranging from 1941 to 1945. All aspects of Japanese life revolved around the emperor and the war effort. Atsushi Koketsu describes that, that there were no individuals in Imperial Japan during this period. Instead, people were objects of the state in the concerted effort for Imperial victory. Such total devotion includes the war itself and the wartime economy. Production always came first for the home front. Once Japan surrendered, that total commitment to production remained out of necessity. Sumio Nishizaki notes that Japan's overseas territories were lost. Investment in assets were lost, and millions of individuals had to return to Japan. Japanese totality manifested itself in another form, not devoted to war, but to expanding, rebuilding, and improving their economy. Japanese civilians went through a transition period from their total devotion to the emperor, and by the early 1960s, that devotion manifested itself in the Japanese economy. Generations of Japanese civilians still carried out their total war abilities through the 1970s, on a societal level. Thus, Japan underwent a massive economic boom from the early 1960s through the 1980s. That economic boom greatly affected historians, who focused primarily on the good of westernization and a change from imperial rule to a stable democracy. Many former soldiers helped lead the way, embracing Western economic values instead of communism. Japan devoted itself to building a material-based society, focusing all its resources and abilities on forming one of the world's most powerful economies. Total economics was formulated in school, the workplace, and within their politics. 1965 was the surrender's 20th anniversary. Japan's economic boom was at its height, and many historians consider this decade a time of significant progress. Many academics also admitted that this was because they did not get a cruel peace as imperial propaganda stated. The fact that Japan did not receive the same unconditional surrender terms as Germany did help boost their ability to rebuild and grow. Prime Minister Ikeda Hayato made the bold statement to double Japan's income by 1970, and thus Japanese politics primarily revolved around this idea. James Reston explains that every generation rewrites history based on its own experiences. To understand how Japan viewed its history, he compares it to America's treatment of the Vietnam War. While the extent is not the same, the idea behind the statement is, like America downplaying the atrocities committed in Vietnam, Japan continued to do the same 
to help justify and defend its national pride. The seeds of victimhood were sown back in the 1950s with a cultural reaction to Japanese historians viewing Japan as the villain in the historical narrative. During the Vietnam War, Japan saw a glut of historical articles justifying Japan's war to liberate Asia. Biographies, memoirs, and narratives on military leaderships ferment these ideas. The individual became the driving force of Japanese history, such as the deification of Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto. Instead of discussing the whys of World War II, Japanese historians focused on the hows, downplaying the atrocities as incidents necessary for part of the war. The other side of Japanese history was seeing Japan as the victim of Western aggression. While economically Japan embraced Western ideologies, Japan's relationship with the United States was always rocky. Much of this stems from the Japanese-American Joint Security Treaty, ANPA, where violent protests broke out across Japan. America had dropped two atomic bombs on Japan, and many Japanese historians considered this the ultimate form of American aggression against the Japanese people. Japan essentially had two factions. There were the more conservative wings, which did not praise America, but embraced them as a, as a necessary protectorate and ally. And then there were the left wing, who vehemently opposed such alignments in the hopes of maintaining Japanese pacifism and neutrality, which powerfully manifested itself in their histories towards the end of World War II. These historians usually aped their histories on Patrick Blackett and Gar Alperovitz. Both historians were revisionists because they challenged the popular notion that America dropped the two atomic bombs to save American lives. Both Blackett and Alperovitz paint Japan in a light where it was unnecessary to drop the bombs as Japan was already defeated. Japanese historians lunged on this notion and took it to its radical extremes. Victim Japanese historians were usually left-wing. Their most predominant book is A History of the Pacific War, 1973. The book gathered many left-wing historians who claimed that Japan was the victim of World War II and of the atomic bombings. Sadio Asada explains these victims as believing that 500,000 civilians were utterly and meaninglessly sacrificed for America's cruel political purpose. Thus, victim historians were anti-American and popular among protest groups in the 1960s and the 1970s. Japan's revisionism primarily manifested itself in a war of words. Nowhere is the war of words more prevalent than in the Ministry of Education. Saburo Ainaga, one of Japan's most prominent historians, explains that the MOE's war on words began in 1945. American censorship monitored what the MOE thought necessary in their history textbook taught in schools. During the occupation, the MOE's focus was strongly anti-imperial and full of self-chastising for what happened during the war. Ainaga claims that this lasted until 1952. Japanese victimization grew from 1970 to 1989 and saw academics at odds with the popular zeitgeist. Katsuichi Honda was a Japanese correspondent during the Vietnam War who found many survivors of Japanese atrocities and he interviewed them. The older academics used this as an example of Japanese barbarism within their schools. However, they tried to focus on war crimes because this generation of students had no memory of the war. Yet the academics were at odds with the Japanese government attempting to implement a pre-war educational policy. Japanese history textbooks and their content are always rife with domestic and international debate. In the 1980s, Japan saw the Liberal Democratic Party undertake a massive campaign seeking revision of some 100 textbooks with a thrust towards greater respect in effect for Shintoism, business, duties instead of rights, and the military instead of pacifism. Many younger Japanese historians fell victim to these policies and mentalities. Japan's MOE is required to review all new and old textbooks within education. Their job is to provide critiques to the authors. Saburo Ainaga's groundbreaking book, A New History of Japan, needed to use new language on its third edition. The MOE demanded Ainaga's language to tone down the description of Japan's activities during the 15 years of war. The Ministry of Education tends to side with the conservative political wing in Japan, because Japanese conservatives made educational issues a part of their political activity. The United States sees a similar case with the Department of Education. However, instead of right-wing politics, the DOE tends to lean left-wing. The MOE openly forced history textbook authors, like Ayanaga, to change aggression-invasion to advancements in 1982. The verbiage downplays Japan's action, causing controversies and threatening Japan's national security on five significant occasions, 1982, 1986, 2001, 
2005 and 2015. These controversies were all due to the wording and the exclusion of details. In the 1980s, China and South Korea greatly objected to the whitewashing of history textbooks. In 1989, Japan's academic curriculum changed entirely, emphasizing historical revisionism. Ayanaga widely protested these revisions in his textbooks. He claims that it violated the basic law in education, which became law in 1965. However, the political winds of Japan had changed. Interest groups became history writers. The National Congress to Protect Japan was a predominant revisionist group interested in rewriting older textbooks. Many of these openly called for the repeal of Article 9 and celebrated battles like Okinawa as a grand story of great sacrifice for the state and dying in the last battle of a lost cause. Okinawa was not an example of great suffering because of the evils of Japanese imperialism. Instead, it was the opposite, a story of great suffering because of American aggression. Throughout the 1980s and 1990s, Japan's primary focus within its histories and politics was reconciliation. The widespread yearning for reconciliation peaked in 1994 with the resignation of Prime Minister Morohiro Hasekawa. He resigned for making controversial statements about the Nanking Massacre. The political and academic circles advocated for reconciliation, primarily focusing on its neighbors, and a Prime Minister openly downplaying Japan's involvement in atrocities went against that decade's zeitgeist. In Japan, this movement became the international approach. These historians usually compare Japan's wars in the Pacific with Euro-American and Soviet wars, emphasizing diplomacy among nations. Another wing of Japanese historians focused on topics previously seen as taboo or flat-out downplayed. One area is comfort woman and sexual slavery as part of the popular race and gender historical movement. The biggest reason for these new approaches was a new memory and a generation that was untethered from the burdens of ideological commitments of their respective mentors. James Reston describes Japan as at a benchmark during this period. The economic prosperity from the 1960s lost its significance for the youth and the new generation of Japanese historians. Instead of focusing on gaining wealth, this generation was born into it. The economy was strong, the material needs no longer had the emphasis on the population as it did within the 1960s and the 1970s. Thus, the youth began looking for Japan's soul. What were their origins? What was Japan's place in the world? How did Japan impact the world? What does being Japanese mean? These questions could only truly occur 40 years after Japan's surrender, as a new generation of people were unassociated with the humiliation of the defeat. The youth and their parents did not know the harshness of war. Therefore, the memory gap allowed Japanese people and young historians to look at World War II with new eyes. Japanese popular culture historically tackled such ideas during the 1960s. In terms of World War II, the Pacific War Research Society's Japan's Longest Day was a seminal work that tried to answer such questions. This book chronicles the last 24 hours of World War II, but also seeks to explain the death of an old Japan with the birth of modern Japan. When the book became a movie in 1967, it sparked a new wave of Japanese war films that praised Japan's resilience and devotion to defending their nation, but also downplayed their imperialistic tendencies. Japan began releasing World War II films around the anniversaries of the battles in question. The key is that these historical books and films sought to help explain what being Japanese meant. Hints of this yearning are visible back during the U.S. occupation. America effectively cut Japan off from its cultural heritage. In 1982, Yasuhiro Nakasone became prime minister. For Japan, this was significant, as he was a World War II naval officer. His slogan was, the final settlement of post-war politics. However, his focus was internal and not external. He aimed to reform post-war American-guided reformations and turn them into cherishing Japanese values over foreign ones. Such a political movement is not dissimilar to what Ronald Reagan was doing over in the United States. American revisionist historians target historians who paint U.S. history in a positive light. Revisionists take many forms, but they are usually liberal in many of their ideas and approaches. Marxists, New Left, race and gender, and postmodern historians are generally considered revisionists. These historians focus on new areas of history such as race and gender, social and economic, and general reforms of a more traditional society. In Japan, there is not a new left movement. Instead, Japan is the opposite. 
Japanese revisionists are pro-imperialism, while Western revisionists are overwhelmingly against it. They take the traditional histories and challenge them. The New Right's focus is World War II and Japan's relationship with its imperial past. The 1980s MOE policy shift greatly aided the revisionists. Pictures of barbarism were not allowed in textbooks, and books must include Soviet and American atrocities in the name of fairness. The MOE never denied the atrocities, but wanted to downplay them as a common occurrence during wartime. The Yasukuni Shrine is widely considered a Japanese revisionist playground. The shrine, erected long before World War II, wishes to paint Japan's actions in a more positive light. It is a dedication to their dead. They're greeted with a pamphlet that reads, quote, Japan was forced to defend its independence and maintain peace in Asia by engaging in war with other nations on several occasions. These wars had to be fought to ensure Japan's independence and its prosperity as a peaceful member of the Asian community. Many New Right historians see the shrine as means of explaining their past and thus Japan's soul. The Asakuni Shrine is also a Shintoist shrine, making it a historical landmark as well as a museum. Kobayashi Yoshinori is a prominent Japanese revisionist historian. His book, Kokumin no Rikishi, describes a great history of Japan from the Japanese perspective. Many foreign historians criticize his work for redefining words to best suit the author's narrative. Tsukuri Kai is another revisionist group. Their focus is on middle school textbooks, which emphasize statism and militaristic nationalism. Japan is far from historical consensus about World War II. Shinzo Abe agreed to reconsider Article 9 in Japan's post-war constitution in 2014. However, 2015 saw violent leftist protests demanding the literal interpretation of Japan's constitution. They sought absolute pacifism and forced Abe to withdraw the notion. The MOE also issued new textbook changes that year, removing mentions of comfort women and downplaying their role in World War II. The conservatives seek to reignite aspects of Japan's past and look to their actions as no different than American or European actions in other wars. The liberal wings still seek Japan's pacifism. The only area where both alignments meet is the idea of Japan as a victim of American aggression. I like to apologize right now for the absolute butchering of Japanese names. I've always had a very hard time with Japanese names. Once again, I provided a full bibliography in the description below containing links to where you can further read and expand upon this notion. I had no intentions of this being a definitive work on Japanese historiography as much as it is just an outline showcasing how Japan views its history and its place within World War II. With all that being said, I thank you all for watching. All my social media is in the description below. In the end,